Good morning, everybody. And uh, it's my name is Sarah Strauss. I'm the event manager at Kirsten Bosch. Welcome to another Wednesday talk at Kirsten Bosch, supported by Room to Grow and Stroke Nature. Uh, it's a beautiful spring morning here at, at Kirsten Bosch today after a lot of rain. So, uh, yeah, we, we see spring coming out here and it's, it's just wonderful uh, to see. Uh, see this here in this beautiful botanical garden. Today we're very pleased to have Johan Marais here with us, a very well-known uh, herpetologist and uh, uh, author on snakes. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to host him here with us today. Uh, our talk today is on snakes in our gardens. So Johan will be telling us about what you do when you encounter a snake in the garden, which kinds of snakes you're most likely to encounter. And um, we will also be giving us some insights in snakes and, and snake bites uh, in general. Johan is, um, oh, just changing to my document here. Johan Marais is a naturalist, a conservationist, herpetologist and photographer. And he has been involved with reptiles for over uh, 40 years. He has written many books on reptiles, which collectively have sold over half a million copies. And he is currently the CEO of the African Snake Bite Institute. And uh, this organization uh, offers courses on snake awareness, first aid for snake bites, uh, the medical treatment of snake bite and uh, venomous snake handling. So yeah, over to Johan. Welcome, Johan. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Morning, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, quite a busy program this morning. It is spring. It's uh, nice and warm. Uh, the snakes are beginning to move. Um, we're getting reports from all over the place that people are beginning to see snakes on the move. And, uh, and obviously, as things get hotter, there's going to be more snakes around. So uh, we're going to focus on snakes and gardens. Um, and uh, just quickly get this out of the way. Right, I'm just trying to get my, my PowerPoint to move on. There we go. Right, so um, one of the complexities about snakes in Southern Africa uh, with regards to identification is that we have roughly 173 species. That's a lot of snakes. Um, there's a lot of color variation and this makes identification incredibly difficult. So if you look at the bottom right picture, for instance, that's a nice example. Um, that is a mole snake. And uh, it's a kind of variety that you don't often see. It's an adult that still has quite a bit of the juvenile colors. So if you're in the Western Cape, there's a likelihood you're gonna see uh, pitch black mole snakes. You might see very, very dark gray ones, the odd uh, dark brown or brick red one. But up in Gauteng, the mole snakes are, um, are usually a light brown to a reddish brown color. So color is the last thing that you need to look at when it comes to identifying snakes. I think one of the important things is always look at the locality, look at where you've seen a snake and consider its distribution. So in my books, I have, uh, I have good uh, distribution maps. So if you're, for instance, in Gauteng, uh, let's say in, in Santon, and uh, you think you've seen a Cape Cobra in your garden, it's unlikely because they don't occur there. And this, of course, it's a, it's a hitchhiker or someone's escapee. So 173 different types. Uh, and of those, uh, 73 of them are what we term not venomous. So these snakes have no venom whatsoever. Um, the, the house snakes and the mold snakes and the egg eaters and the bush snakes. But most of them do have teeth. And obviously, snakes can still bite, even if they, if they have no venom. Then we move on to venomous snakes. 51 of, uh, 51 of them are back fanged. So the back fanged snakes are those snakes that have fangs very far back in the mouth, sort of roughly below the eye or even further back. And of those 51, two of them are regarded as highly venomous. So top left is the Gwurmslung. And uh, bottom right is the vine or twig snake. Um, Wormslung vary tremendously in, in coloration. 
So uh, the green ones up here in Gauteng and most of Pumalanga, Limpopo, KwaZulu Natal are the males and the females are usually brown. Not always, but most of the time. But then in the Western Cape, uh, we get wormslungs that have sort of black or, or dark, dark gray on top. And the sides are yellowish, greenish, or even orange. So again, very, very confusing. Um, the rest of the backfang snakes, the scarp seekers, the heralds, the tiger snakes, the, sands, the sand snakes, they all have a very mild venom. So when I talk about a mild venom or mildly venomous, uh, it's less than a bee sting. It's very little to be concerned with. Fortunately, these two highly venomous backfang snakes are tree living or shrub living. So they're usually up in shrubs or trees. They are extremely docile and bites from them are very rare. Uh, we see maybe one or two or three bites a year and it's invariably someone that accidentally stood on one or maybe try to catch one or grab it. I'm going to talk about that as we go along. Guys, don't touch snakes. Don't try and catch, catch them. Uh, please don't try and kill them. Uh, don't try and grab them with your bright tongues. That's not a good idea. Then we have the highly venomous snakes, cobras, mambas, and their relatives. Their relatives, relatives would be uh, the coral snakes, the shield nose snakes, the garter snakes. And um, all of these snakes belong to one family that we call elapids. And the common feature is that all of them have short fixed fangs in the front of the mouth. So these shortish fixed fangs, even black mambas, the fangs rarely exceed about five or six millimeters. And most of these snakes are highly venomous. So we've got to be really, really careful with them. And then the, the next group are the, the adders, 16 of them. Uh, two of them are considered uh, potentially deadly, the puff adder and the gaboon adder. But then there's other adders that we must be very careful of. Uh, and berg adders feature quite prominently in bites. These bites are often very serious and um, victims usually need to be hospitalized. So again, uh, the adders are one big family and they have large hinged fangs in the front of the mouth. So when these snakes aren't using their fangs, those fangs fall back against the roof of the mouth. So snakes and gardens, you know, people often call us and say they think they have a nest of snakes. There's no such thing as a nest of snakes. Snakes don't live in a nest. Yes, they lay eggs, as you can see in the photograph. Um, that usually happens around uh, uh, early or late summer. And um, most snakes will lay their eggs and abandon them. So they lay the eggs underground usually, maybe in a hollow, in a hollow tree trunk under a rock, and they abandon their eggs. And those eggs hatch on their own a month or two or three later. So you don't really have this sort of massive snakes that live in your roof, in the nest. That just doesn't happen. Snakes, by and large, are loners. They're on their own. Um, however, when those eggs hatch, you're obviously going to have a bunch of babies moving off in different directions. The parents aren't close by. The parents have, the mother laid those eggs months back. She's nowhere to be seen. Um, and those babies then disperse and they all move in different directions. They have to go and find a life of their own. So if you come across a uh, baby snake soon after hatching or soon after a female has given birth, there is a pretty good chance that you might see more, more than one of them. Now with all these snakes, that, that lay their eggs, there are two exceptions. Pythons and the spotted scarp sticker actually remain with their eggs. They protect them, they coil around them. So we quite often find pythons on, on, on eggs and art frog holes. And um, when we look under rocks and logs, we quite often find scarp stickers coiled around their, their eggs. So why the snakes in the gardens? Well, there's a variety of reasons for that. A lot of us live on the edges of good natural bush, on the edges of, um, of game, of reserves. Um, but a lot of snakes have also adapted well to urbanization. So it's not unusual to get snakes like brown house snakes or slug eaters or herald snakes in people's gardens. And to some degree, it might be about finding shelter. We have nice rockeries and piles of building rubble behind the garage where snakes can crawl under and, and hide nicely. Um, we might have water features. Water, water attracts the frogs, and a lot of snakes eat frogs. So water features might bring, bring the snakes in. But at the same time, most of our modern gardens have irrigation systems. 
So we have toads in the gardens, and yes, that is going to going to attract snakes. Aviaries, uh, an abundance of food for rodents, attracting rats and mice. Uh, lots of bird nests in your trees. All of those might just attract snakes. Uh, good food will bring them in. So our advice is usually just keep your garden clean. Keep it well maintained. Make sure you don't have piles of building rubble around. And uh, unfortunately, piles of rocks might be a nice hiding place for, for snakes. So keep those to minimum. So there we can see a baby snake coming out of an egg. And um, there's a new myth uh, that's doing the rounds that baby snakes are far more venomous than the parents because they apparently can't control their venom. Well, there's no truth to that. That just isn't the case. Baby snakes are venomous. If they're from venomous parents, they have a similar venom, not necessarily identical, uh, but the venom is quite similar. But what we must remember about baby snakes is that their venom yield is far less than adults. So they have a fraction of the amount of venom that adult snakes do. Keeping snakes out of your garden. There are lots of stories. You know, people use um, various substances to repel snakes. These substances include Jay's fluid, old oil, uh, mothballs, Connie's crystals, uh, certain plants like geraniums and wild garlic. Um, and as you can see, they're snake repellents. Unfortunately, there is no substance that keeps snakes out of your garden. It's a total myth. Don't waste your time and money. There's nothing that we know of that you can spray or put down that's going to keep snakes out. And this has been tested. We've run various tests. There's some interesting publications coming out soon on these tests, showing the results. Um, and the effect of all of these so-called repellents is abs absolutely zero. Just doesn't work. So what do we do if we see a snake in a garden? Well, you know, people uh, quite often kill snakes. Not a good idea because you're getting into the danger zone. And what I want you to remember is that in any snake encounter, be it in your garden or in your house, if you back off five paces, just five paces, you are absolutely safe and you cannot get bitten. It's easy, move away five paces. And don't try and catch them with your bright tongs or go and bend a wire coat hanger and you know, you've seen something on television and you now think you have an idea on how to catch a snake. That's looking for trouble. Even small snakes, small snakes are particularly difficult to work with. So a baby Cape Cobra or a baby Black Mamba or Wumsung, they're difficult, they're not easy to capture. So don't touch them with your hands, stay away from them. We have, um, we have about 700 snake removers countrywide. And they're on the ASI app. And I'll tell you more about the app later. It's a free app that you can download. So all you do is you go to your app, you press on snake removal, and the names of the, of the snake removers closest to you will pop up with their phone number. So rather do that. You have a snake, watch it from a safe distance. Then run away and go and call the snake remover. Because by the time you come back, uh, the, snake is, uh, the snake is long gone. So keep an eye on it. And um, get that snake remover to come and to come and remove it for you. Right, common snakes in gardens. One of the most common snakes that we have is the brown house snake. And it's called brown house snake because it, it frequents houses. And if you look at the distribution map in the, in the top, uh, at the top in the middle, you'll see that these snakes occur countrywide. Very, very common. Uh, they are, when they're small, they might eat the odd lizard. But as they grow up, they are rodent specialists. So if you find the odd brown house snake in your garden, there is a likelihood that you have mice or rats in your garden. So they do a great job. They're good to have around. They are uh, nocturnal. So we're not going to see them during the day. But as it gets dark, they emerge. And there you can see some of their features. So the main feature, how one identifies a brown house snake, is that light line that runs from the nose through the eye to the back of the head. See it there? Color-wise, they vary from a chocolate brown down in KwaZulu-Natal to a medium brown, light brown, reddish brown, but uh, you'll always see that light line from the nose through the eye to the back of the head. 
average around 50 centimeters, but they can get up to about one and a half meters, although that is exceptional. So that's the brown house snake, very common, very abundant. Um, and uh, we find them in a, in a lot of gardens. The red lip or herald snake, uh, another very common garden snake, especially in the Cape, uh, down in KwaZulu-Natal and Durban, where I come from. And um, in some parts of their range, they have a red lip, but in other parts of the range, like top left, that one is from Batuba Tuba, they don't have the red lip. The bottom left one has a bit of a yellowish upper lip, and that one is from uh, Purdy Beach. So herald snakes are toad eaters. They come into your garden because you have toads, and that is what they eat. So if you have an abundance of toads, there's a likelihood that you're going to attract these snakes. Like the brown house snake, they are harmless. They, technically, they have, a, they have venom, but their venom has absolutely no effect on humans or on pets like cats and dogs. So there you can see the herald snake very often have the, the reddish on the upper lip, but not always. Uh, another feature that, that you can look out for is that um, the head is darker than the rest of the body. So there you can see the dark head. Um, and then the body might have the odd white speckle on it, usually a, a lightish to medium gray color, but they can be brownish as well. Uh, distribution, widely distributed in the wetter eastern part of the country. Average length around 40, 50 centimeters, but it, they can get up to about 80 centimeters in length. And like the brown house snake, the herald snakes are nocturnal. You, not going to, you're not going to see them in the day. Mole snakes, very, very common in the Western Cape and parts of the, the Southern and Eastern Cape. Up here in Gauteng, uh, down in KwaZulu-Natal, we don't see that many of them. But again, there you can see enormous color variation. Distribution, widespread. And these snakes in the Western Cape can exceed two meters in them. They're big snakes um, and they have sharp teeth. You don't want to grab one, they can bite. So be careful. Have a look at the photograph in the middle. That is what the juveniles look like. They have a lot of markings. They're quite colorful. Um, and people find it quite difficult to identify these little mole snakes. And they're abundant in the breeding season. A female can have up to 80 or more babies at a time. So they're already really widespread. They, they're sort of rodent specialists when they're adults. So they love those mole rat burrows that you have all over the Cape. Um, hence their, their abundance in the Western Cape. So there we can see a few different color variations. Right, what do we look at? A very muscular snake, sort of uh, the body is quite round and muscular. Uh, it has a pointed head that's not very distinct from the rest of the body. Um, shiny scales and active in the day. You don't really see mole snakes at night. You see them in the day. Another snake that we often find in gardens, especially if you have uh, streams or flays near you, is uh, the brown water snake, a harmless snake, active at night. They feed on fish and frogs, and uh, they quite often have that sort of uh, salmon pink belly. But other than that, it's quite a nondescript snake. They can be nearly black, but they're usually sort of a medium to dark brown in color. Uh, there we can see it, a long slender snake, uh, the bulging brown eyes, um, and check that upper lip. That upper lip is usually a light color, the same color as the belly. Another garden snake, the common egg eater or rhombic egg eater. And these snakes are completely harmless. They don't have teeth. They can't bite you. Well, they do have teeth, but they are greatly reduced. And again, you'll see very widely distributed. They are active at night. Uh, you're not going to see them in the day. And um, if you have a lot of birds' nests in your garden, if you uh, have birds in an aviary, uh, there's a pretty good chance you can attract these little harmless snakes. They put up quite a show when you, when you confront them. Uh, the photograph in the middle, they will open their mouth. Um, and the next thing they do is they coil and uncoil, as you can see on the bottom left photograph. And they rub their body scales together to make a hissing sound to scare you off. But they're completely harmless. So there you see it. Um, very rough scales on the body, uh, a few V markings on the head and neck. So the V markings go from the head down to the neck. Um, this could, some people confuse these snakes for the night adder, but uh, as I've said, 
uh, they're completely harmless. See, here's the problem. In the top, we've got the harmless egg eater with those bee markings on the head and the neck. In the middle, you have the venomous night adder, but we'll talk about that later because we need to look at where they occur. Uh, the sting bee marking, and below that, the harmless mole snake. Egg eaters are active at night. The night adder, despite its common name, is active during the day. And then the bottom one, the little mole snake, that of course is also active during the day. Green snakes, green snakes are a nightmare because everyone thinks that every green snake that they see is a green mamba. So the green mambas occur along the KwaZulu-Natal coast, usually very close to the sea. I always say to people, if you cannot hear the sea or see the sea or smell the sea, it's probably not a green mamba. So there you see the green mamba top left, there are a few yellow dots in it sometimes. Top right is the, the green version of the Gwumsung with a big, big, big eye. Uh, the middle left is the green water snake, quite widely distributed, um, goes down the coast into the, uh, into the Western Cape. Um, usually a smallish snake, 30, 40 centimeters in length and completely harmless. The harmless Western Natal green snake, it occurs south of the Isapingo River to Amanzum Toti and KwaZulu Natal, comes inland through Hillcrest and Pine Town, and then goes up to the KwaZulu Natal Drakensberg and up into Gauteng and uh, right down to, to the Western Cape as well. They're completely harmless. They average probably 40, 50, 60 centimeters in length, good climbers, but completely harmless. The bottom left is the Eastern Natal green snake. So that occurs north of the Isapingo River through Durban, the bluff up to Mslanga Rocks, all up the coast, and eventually they end up in the, in the eastern parts of the Kruger National Park. And then the bottom right one is the spotted or variegated bushnake. Um, I think I have a photo. Oh, there we go. There's the spotted bushnake. You can see its distribution. Front half of the body has the blackish spots, and the back half is usually quite plain. Another completely harmless snake. So most of the little thin green harmless snakes um, are mistaken for the green mamba. But remember, we only have green mambas along that coastal bush of KwaZulu Natal. Around Durban and those areas, within a few kilometers of the sea. But when you get up to Mkuzi and Shushlui, they go about 40 kilometers inland. Um, right, so those are the green snakes. Most of them, nothing to worry about. The spotted bush snakes eat the, those geckos. So we, uh, in places like Durban, you find them in your outbuildings, between the, the roofs and the walls, where they, uh, they're excellent climbers, and they're always up there looking for geckos. Slug eaters, very common on the Western Cape. Quite a bit of color variation. A smallish snake, um, completely harmless. They are slug specialists, snail specialists. So uh, not a bad snake to have in your garden. So you can see the little uh, slug eater, quite a nondescript little snake. It might have that um, broad band down the back, but it might not. And in Afrikaans, we call them tabakrolikis because in self-defense, they are known to roll up in a little roll that looks like the old tobacco rolls. Distribution-wise, wise the, the wetter eastern half of the country, uh, not common in KwaZulu-Natal, but very common down in the western and the eastern Cape. Right, the spotted scarp steaker. So these snakes um, are very mildly venomous. Uh, this is the other snake that, uh, other than the python, that uh, stays with its eggs. And again, a tremendous amount of color variation. Top right, typical West Coast National Park, Western Cape. Top left, typical Moy River, uh, Nottingham Road, those areas. Bottom left, uh, typical high felt coloration, Gauteng. And then the bottom right one is, uh, I think that one is from the Free State. So they're very lot in color. They are mildly venomous. They're no threat. And they can be extremely common in some areas. They're active in the day and they're very fast moving. So when you disturb them, they usually disappear very, very quickly. Then we have a variety of grass snakes, grass and sand snakes. So this is just one of them, the short snouted, uh, common in Gauteng down into KwaZulu-Natal. They're all um, long and thin. They're active in the day. Uh, they invariably have stripes from head to tail. And if you find a snake that has these longitudinal stripes from head to tail, it's nothing to worry about. There's another one of them, the little crossbar grass snake, very common down in the Western and Eastern Cape. 
uh, slightly stubbier, but again, it has those stripes from head to tail. Right, so th those were some of the, the common sort of harmless and mildly venomous garden snakes, the ones that you will encounter mostly. But everyone should be aware of the fact that you could end up with a highly venomous snake in your garden. And uh, the Cape Cobra is one of them. Um, they, they do pop up in suburban gardens. They are highly venomous. They're not aggressive. They're very quick to move off if given the chance. But uh, if you accidentally corner one, they'll hood as you see here. And uh, once they in that defensive pose, uh, they will strike if you get close enough. Now, one of the biggest problems we have with these venomous snakes is dogs. Cats are smart enough to avoid large snakes. Yes, they'll catch small ones, but they're not going to look for trouble with big ones. But dogs, uh, they're not always the smartest. They see a snake, they want to grab it. Um, and so if you have a snake in your garden and you do have dogs, get the dogs out of there immediately. Very, very, very important. So there you see the distribution. Just to give you an indication, uh, we have a snake remover in, uh, in Montague who removes close on 200 of these snakes a year from suburban uh, gardens in, that, in the greater Montague area. So they are extremely common and very often found in gardens. So be very, very careful of them. This is one of the most dangerous snakes that we have. Uh, the Cape Cobra and the Black Mamba are the two snakes with the most potent venom. And um, they usually account for those 10 to 12 snake bite deaths a year that we have in this country. So very, very, very dangerous snake. So there you can see some of the features of the Cape Cobra. Quite quick to, to make a hood. Um, they vary massively in color uh, from near black to, to bright orange, uh, bright yellow, or with speckles. If you look at their distribution, they go right up from the Western Cape, they get up to Clarksdorp and Potchefstroom, uh, but they don't quite make it into Gauteng and uh, Limpopo province. Right, Mozambique spinning cobras from southern KwaZulu Natal. This is an extremely dangerous snake, uh, often found uh, in uh, suburban gardens, even up here in Pretoria East, where I live. And um, what is very disturbing of the Mozambique spitting cobra is that it is quite well known to enter houses at night uh, while it's searching for food, go, comes in through an open sliding door or the gaps under your front or back door. And uh, they quite often bite people while they're asleep. These bites are uh, quite scary. They're often in the face. They do a lot of tissue damage. Um, and in the high risk areas, like in the Northern KwaZulu-Natal, we recommend that people put mosquito doors on their, their exit doors uh, and even sleep under mosquito nets. So this is really a, a problem snake. So how do you identify it? Brown in color um, or a slatish gray often has a bit of black between the scales, a few dark bars on the chest, quite quick to spread a hood. And you'll see that there's a bit of black in the face as well. The runkles, um, again, regarded as a highly venomous snake, but we, we haven't had a fatality in over 40 years. And the main reason for that is that this snake is usually very close to, to its, its permanent hole. And the moment you disturb them, they disappear down the hole unless you have a dog that corners them. Then they hood and they, they bite a lot of dogs and they kill a lot of dogs. But bites on humans are very, very rare. So in Gauteng, it's a, a very common snake on small holdings. And if you live in grasslands with flays close by, uh, there's a pretty good chance you could find these snakes in your garden. They're quick to spread a hood. They also spit their venom. And on the bottom right picture, you can see that this snake uh, often plays dead. So whatever you do, don't touch it. Uh, the banded variety, top left photograph, those are the ones in KwaZulu Natal and down in the Cape provinces. But in Gauteng, they are sort of blackish with those white bars on the chest. There you can see it, both varieties. Uh, the two or three white bars are quite characteristic. Um, a very skittish snake. If you give them half a chance, they're gone. And they average around a meter in length uh, with a maximum of about one and a half meters. Right, puff adders, widespread, occur throughout the country. And yes, they do end up in gardens. Um, a, a, a highly venomous snake, uh, nasty cytotoxic or, uh, or cell-destroying venom. 
Uh, we rarely see fatalities amongst humans, but their bites do a lot of damage. And uh, dogs very often get bitten by puff adders. They, they are one of, it's one of our fastest striking snakes. You see one of these snakes in your garden, get your dogs away very, very quickly. There's uh, some of the features. They've got these uh, V markings down their back, a uh, bit of a dark triangle under the eye, and they are short and stubby snakes. Average around 80 centimeters in length, very rarely exceed about 1,2 meters in length. Night adders. So you see they go right down to close to Hermanus. Uh, these snakes are, uh, are fairly venomous. People often underestimate their venom but we see dogs up to about 19 kilograms getting killed by night adders. So it has that distinct V marking on the head and uh, in parts of the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal where they're abundant, uh, they account for a fair number of bites on humans. Um, and you could even end up going to hospital. So there you can see the V marking on the head, the rhombic markings down the back, uh, average about 40 to 60 centimeters, but they can get up to one meter. So be careful of the snake. As I say, a lot of people underestimate the venom of the night adder. <laughs> right, and black mambas, of course. Not an aggressive snake at all, but extremely venomous. Um, it's uh, usually a, a light or dark gray in color. Uh, look at the distribution. So it occurs uh, from Qu uh, southern KwaZulu-Natal up into Mpumalanga. Uh, only reaches Gauteng in uh, northern Deno King and at Redeplat uh, Dam. So in most of Johannesburg, Pretoria, uh, we do not have black mambas. So there are some of the features. It's a large snake. They average about 2.2 to 2.6 meters, uh, but they can get up to about 3.8 meters. Grayish in color, might be an olivey brown color, the, the long coffin shaped head. And uh, if you confront one of these, they're quite quick to open their mouth and get it into a striking position. I've already mentioned it's not an aggressive snake. The, the snake removers in Durban, in the greater Durban area, remove well over 100 black mambas a year from suburban gardens, and bites on humans are just about unheard of in that area. So just uh, don't, get in, don't get close to them. Don't uh, try and kill them or mess with them. Now, if there's one snake I want you to remember today, it's the stiletto snake. We used to call it a burrowing adder or a burrowing asp. Uh, if you look at the distribution, it's absent from the Western and Eastern Cape, uh, most of uh, Lesotho. Uh, but this little snake lives underground. It averages around 30, 40 centimeters in length. Um, comes to the surface in summer, especially after heavy rains. So you can see it. Uh, nondescript, has a little pig-like eye, and it has these big fangs that stick out from the sides of the jaw. And if you pick the snake up, you will get bitten. A lot of people pick these snakes up. You cannot hold it behind the head because those fangs will get you. So there you can see the fangs, formidable. We have no antivenom for it. And it's not a deadly snake, but if you get a bite from one of these, you're gonna have swollen fingers and um, there's a pretty good chance you might lose a digit or two. So whatever you do, don't try and pick up little blackish snakes. Um, from January to February, we probably have about a dozen bites a week from the snake that we hear of. Right, so then let's very briefly just chat about first aid for snake bites. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation. Uh, there's a lot of outdated books uh, listing first aid methods that we used many, many years back. Um, I think the most important thing is what you don't do. Do not apply an arterial tourniquet for a snake bite. You can see a message from, Dr. from Professor David Worrell from Oxford University. Uh, he's the World Health Organization snake bites expert. And he says, uh, arter arterial tourniquets are dangerous. Um, as I have uh, recommended in all of my books, I've always made it very clear that people should not use arterial tourniquets. So stay away from them. Don't try and suck out venom. That doesn't work. All these little devices, unfortunately, some of them are still available on the internet. Uh, we've tested them. They have zero impact. They just do not work. Stay away from electric shock. That was another myth that you can use electric current to neutralize snake venom. So forget about that. And then traditional remedies, whether it is snake stones or 
uh, herbal concoctions. Uh, we have no evidence of any of these substances that have any benefit whatsoever. So the most important advice for a snake bite is to get the person to the nearest hospital. It's as simple as that. You have someone bitten by a snake, get them into a vehicle and go straight to the nearest hospital. The thing that kills you in a snake bite in the short term is a lack of breathing. And if you can get to a hospital, they can ventilate you. Then they can worry about further treatment and whether you need antivenom. Um, nine out of 10 snake bite victims that end up in hospital do not need antivenom. So antivenom is a wonderful drug, but it's not always needed. So first aid, uh, get to a hospital. It gets far more complex than that. If you want to uh, really um, get involved with uh, more advanced methods of, of first aid, um, I suggest you uh, have a look at my books. Uh, I've described all the do's and don'ts. I have the same um, first aid uh, methods on the app as well, the ASI app. So make sure you have the right emergency numbers handy. Uh, these are also on the app. Um, uh, private ambulance services, uh, the emergency number 112. The good thing about that is that you can actually dial 112 without airtime or without a SIM card. Uh, African Snake Bite Institute, that's my number. And then there is the Poison Information Center's number as well. So phone those emergency numbers, get your patient to the nearest hospital as quickly as you can. And then spitting snakes. Um, the Runcast and the Mozambique Spitting Cobra are the two common spitters. Venom in the eyes, you rinse the eyes with water. Only water, forget about milk and beer and all the other things. Rinse the eyes with water, get that person to a doctor. The doctors will examine the eye, they will treat it with, a, with an antibiotic cream. And um, if, you, if you follow those rules, you're going to recover fully within a day or two or three. So venom in the eyes is not that bad. As far as your pets go, if your dog or cat gets spat, if your dog or cat gets bitten by a snake, you get it to a vet. Forget about all of the other treatments, uh, milk down their throats, uh, activated charcoal, uh, allergics tablets. Those things do nothing for your pet. They just keep you happy. It doesn't help. Get your animal to a vet as quickly as you can. Right. So there's the, uh, the app, uh, ASI Snakes. It has a whole bunch of nice features. As I mentioned, it's free. Um, first aid measures, uh, snake removers. It has uh, local snakes. If you're in Clarksdorp and you see a snake and you press on local snakes, it will list those snakes in the area only. So it makes identification very easy. And we also have a feature there for snake identification. You can use your app, photograph a snake, and send it to us, and we will identify it. And then, of course, um, Posters, we have developed over 200 posters, all cities, major towns, game reserves, uh, provinces, and these posters are free downloads from our, web, from our website. So you can go to the African Snake Bite Institute website, you download your poster, print it, and you can use it uh, however you wish. And then lastly, the books, and of course, there's a fantastic special today. You can uh, get the, my snake books at a discount. Um, and I'm sure Sarah is going to tell us more about that. Right, and I think that's me done for now. Sarah, uh, I think it's time for, uh, for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Johan. I think we've all learned a lot. And we have a few questions here indeed. We had uh, questions in the, in the chat and on the Q&A about uh, the snakes, about snakes with a smell. Um, one question was, why do... Um, uh, the tabakro, like the slug eaters, why do they smell so badly? Well, all snakes have uh, musk glands and um, it's a form of self-defense. So a lot of these snakes, when they're threatened by a predator, will activate their musk glands to scare their predator off. So it's not just the feces coming out of the anus. Adjacent to the anus, they have these musk glands. And it's not just tabakro, like um, Fire snakes are the same. Uh, flower pot snakes are the same. Uh, so a whole bunch of other snakes also give off these really pugnant smells and self-defense. Okay, there was another question around uh, smell as well. Do black mambas have a distinctive uh, smell? Yes, they do. Uh, when we handle black mambas, they have a bit of a curry smell uh, in their feces. So when, when we've handled one and worked with one, you can pick up this sort of curry smell. And a lot of people say that they, it's the smell of 
burning potatoes or potatoes that are cooking. But I think the important thing about black mamba smell is I've never in the, in the field, and I've caught hundreds and hundreds of black mambas, I've never smelt them first and found them afterwards. So the smell is more once you handle them, you get this curry smell. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Johan. Some more questions. Um, we have a question here that says, we went walking close to Plet and my children noticed a Scooby-Doo wire, like the old telephone, black, white, and red. Uh, so small, but uh, it was seven centimeters long and thin. Would that have been a baby coral snake? Uh, no, in that area, it will be a baby spotted harlequin snake. So the harlequin snakes are venomous, not uh, dangerously so, but you don't want to get bitten by one. So again, on the app, we have, um, we have a, a profile, so you can actually call up harlequin snake and look at that. But even better, if you buy the book, uh, we have the whole species account with a distribution map, uh, all the details that you want, uh, it's all in there. Okay, thank you, Johan. Another question here, if you call a snake rescuer, do you compensate them? And if so, uh, what should the going rate be? Okay, so with snake rescues, a lot of people do it for free, but there's a lot of expenses. You know, these guys uh, have to pay fuel and car maintenance. Uh, some of the guys might charge a fixed fee, just check with them. And some of the guys ask for a donation. So. I don't, you know, I, I do the rescues free, but uh, I think it's fair to compensate someone. You get a plumber out to fix a leaking tap, you pay them, you know. Um, I would guess, depending on the situation and how far the person has traveled, that the average fee is around uh, 250 to 450 rand. Um, but that's your choice. Okay. And... Another question. My daughter wants a snake as a pet. However, as an environmentalist, I don't agree fully. I don't fully agree unless it is a snake that needs a rehab or can't be released back into the wild. Would we need a permit? And I am fully aware that the, uh, of the fact that many snakes are being kept as pets, especially ball pythons, which is, place, which is placing them at risk of becoming extinct in the wild. Right, nice question. I don't have any problem with snakes in captivity. Uh, some people keep goldfish, some, some people keep cats. Um, so I'm, I'm actually quite fine with that. Uh, I'm not big on pets myself. Um, as far as snakes go, you can't in most provinces, you're not, you're not allowed to take any snake out of the wild and keep it. Uh, if you want to have a brown house snake in Gauteng, it's got to be captive bred and you need a permit for it. So the, 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 the snake keeping fraternity is a big industry. There are thousands of people that do it in South Africa. Yes, ball pythons are very big. These are all captive bred. They do not threaten the wild ones at all. They're all different color morphs. So um, yeah, if you, if you want to keep a pet, just make sure that you have all the right information, uh, the right conditions. They need heating, they need specific diets. Um, so if you're gonna do it, just do it in a humane and a proper way. Thanks, Johan. And uh, what is done with the snakes that are removed from one's garden or, uh, or environment? So snake removers in most provinces have uh, catch and removal permits that are issued by Nature Conservation. And the permits stipulate uh, exactly what they need to do. These snakes are all released. Uh, they're usually released two or three or four or five or up to 10 kilometers away from where they found in a natural area away from people. Uh, none of those snakes um, may be kept or sold or, um, you know, they've got to go back into the wild. So uh, that's quite strict. The only province where um, it differs a bit is KwaZulu-Natal, where you can still keep wild snakes in captivity and you can still keep snakes that you remove. But in all other provinces, you, the snake removers have to release those snakes. Okay. And uh, another question here is, would a mole snake catch a cat? Huh. Unlikely, um, because, uh, you know, adult cats are quite big, but yeah, a mole snake could certainly eat a kitten. And uh, in the greater Durban area, we have good evidence of uh, black mamas eating feral kittens. So that does happen. Okay. And uh, here we have another question. What about snakes in the UK and Europe? Are they on the ASI too? Unfortunately not, no. So we, our main focus is Southern Africa, 
But uh, we do also have, we also have profiles for African snakes, the venomous ones, going all the way up to Egypt. So we concentrate largely on Africa at this stage. Uh, we would love to do other countries, but it becomes quite complex. Okay. And another question: How do you differentiate between moss spitting cobra and snouted cobra? They're quite different snakes. Um, so the the Mozambique spitting cobra uh, is brown and brown to grey in colour, plain brown to plain grey. It might have a bit of black between the scales, maybe a little black on the face. The snouted cobra, um, it has uh, usually has a bit of a pattern, but not always. But what you can see on the snouted cobra is the upper lip uh, is invariably a yellowish or an orangey yellow uh, color. So the upper lip differs from the, the rest of the head. The rest of the head is darker. So if you see that yellowish upper lip, it'll be the snouted cobra, not the Mozambique spitting cobra. But again, have a look on the books and have a look on the app. Thanks, Johan. And then I think there's one more question here. Why is the Southern African python considered dangerous? Well, um, we have had a fatality, uh, only one in the last hundred years. So, uh, you know, when you have a snake that can kill people, uh, in my view, it's dangerous. If you, if you have an adult python bite you, let's say a, a four meter python, you're going to end up with a lot of stitches. You know, uh, we've seen guys needing 70, 80 stitches. So pity from that point of view that it can bite, it is large. Uh, they don't usually see humans as prey. We're not really on their menu. Uh, but we do see the odd python attack where someone gets a bit of a bite and the python lets go. But they have the, they have the ability to kill someone. So um, in our view, pythons are dangerous. Um, just on that also, pythons are protected in every province in South Africa, but they are not endangered or threatened. They are quite abundant, but there are laws protecting them to keep them out of the muti trade and, and people um, exporting them, uh, you know, taking them from the wild and exporting them. So, so all of, in all of our provinces, uh, the Southern African python is uh, is a protected species. Okay, and then we have one last question here. What is the general situation of snakes in, in South Africa? Are they endangered in general or not? Um, we did a we did a very big project uh, a few years ago where we um, produced a reptile atlas. There were twenty eight scientists involved. And uh, what they did for the reptile atlas is they looked at the, uh, the status of every single reptile in South Africa. It was a phenomenal project. It's in fact uh, currently being uh, updated. And um, um, in this publication, in the reptile atlas, we have the, um, the, the status of every single reptile, whether it's critically endangered, endangered, uh, threatened, near threatened, or of least concern. And uh, most of our snakes are doing well. Our biggest threat, of course, is habitat destruction. Uh, but the majority of the snakes are doing really well. And if people want to see the status of these reptiles, they can download the reptile atlas from our website, africansnakebiteinstitute.com. So just go to resources. It's a fantastic document uh, for every species. It has a distribution map, a color photograph, and its threatened status. Okay, thank you, Johan. Uh, more questions keep on coming in. Uh, another one here. Has any research been done on survival rates of relocated snakes? Does that, relocation affect the snake survival in any way? Very nice question. There have been one or two very small studies in other countries. Um, locally, no, we have not done a similar study. There are some theories that the majority of relocated snakes don't survive, but we have no evidence. Um, we you know, we also don't have good data on the survival of snakes in the wild. So one study that was done on puff adders, um, I think about 13 puff adders were, were um, tracked for a year with radio telemetry, and half of them were killed by snouted cobras in that year. So we don't know what the survival rate is in the wild. We don't know what the survival rate is of relocated snakes. And it'll be a very difficult study because you've got to uh, you need a large sample size. So let's say you're working on black mambas. You're going to have to put radio transmitters in maybe 30, 40 of them and follow them for the next two, three, four, five years. So it's a lot of expenses for the equipment. You need people to follow them. And then you only have the data for black mambas. You don't have it for Cape Cobras. You don't have it for puff adders. So it's a, it's a complex study that I don't believe would ever be done. Um, my view, I would much rather see a snake being captured in a garden and relocated 
than someone chopping it in half, chopping it in half with a spade. That's that's a no-brainer. Wow. Okay, Johan, and uh, yeah, then two more questions here. Uh, wrinkles on the Cape Peninsula, is there an effort to reintroduce them? No, not at this stage. Uh, we don't have any efforts to reintroduce, reintroduce any snakes because if a snake becomes sort of locally extinct, which appears to be the case in municipal Cape Town, uh, there are good reasons for that. And uh, quite often it's habitat destruction. So if you've destroyed the habitat or, or you've destroyed the food source, before you can reintroduce it, you need to solve those problems. You need to address those problems. So how do you, if you've, if you've built shopping malls and housing complexes in the Western Cape, how do you reverse that? So fortunately, the Runkas is widespread. It goes all the way up into Gauteng. There's a population in Eastern Zimbabwe. Um, and um, at this stage, there's no real necessity to reintroduce them anywhere. Reintroducing snakes is problematic because there's also genetic purity. So the Runkas from Nottingham Road and the Runkas from Germiston and the Runkas from uh, the Western Cape have different genes. So the last thing you want to do is start mixing these genes um, so we, we talk about genetic purity, leave them where they are. And for that reason, when we rescue a snake, we don't want to take it more than about five or 10 kilometers away because that can also start interfering with genetic purity. Okay, thank you, Johan. And then I think this is the last one now. Uh, any tips for when walking in the Western Cape nature reserves in springtime? Years ago, I had a close encounter with a puff adder in the Helderberg nature reserve. Yes, the majority of snake bites, probably about 84% of snake bites in South Africa are below the knee. So if you're going to be concerned about snakes when you're going on hikes, stick to footpaths, look where you're going. And if you, the only real precaution that you can take is to get yourself a pair of snake gaiters. And these gaiters go from below the knee down to your ankle. Um, they must be made for snake bites. It doesn't help you to buy uh, something cheap from a camping store that keeps uh, blackjacks off your socks. Those aren't going to protect you against snake bite. So gaiters are a cool idea. And there are, we now have gaiters that are super lightweight and very comfortable. So you can walk on them all day long. Okay, thank you, Johan. Thank you so much. Uh, if anybody has further questions uh, for Johan after, after this, I think you can always still post them. Uh, to us or, or send them to us on Facebook and so on and we will we will get answers for you from Johan. Uh, Johan, thank you. This was really fascinating. I think we've learned a lot. I also just want to mention that the Kustenbosch bookshop has a special on all Johan's books this week and that special is 15% off on his books. They're all available in Afrikaans and English and they, um, they are on special from now until next week, Tuesday. So you can buy them at Kustenbosch or on the online store, which is kustenboschbookshop.co.za. So yeah, that is, that is it from us. Thank you again also from Room to Grow, Stroke Nature. Big thank you to Johan once again. And uh, this talk will be, be posted on our Facebook page and on the Stroke Nature Facebook page. So Kustenbosch and Stroke Nature. Uh, so if you uh, would like to share it with friends and so on, please do. And we hope to see you again in, in two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Sarah, thanks to Belinda, uh, the publicist from Strike, for all her hard work. Uh, my publisher, Strike, they're just brilliant. And um, yeah, uh, you know, download the app. Uh, get in touch with us. If we can help with anything, that's what we're here for. Thanks again, Johan. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.